proper store is supposed to start at the beginning. Ain't so simple with this one. Now here's a kid whose whole world got all twisted, leaving him stranded on a rock in the sky. He gets up, sets off for the ba- This is The Bastion, and it is one of my favorite games of all time. So, what is it? Well, it takes place in the land of Ceylondia, which was founded a long time ago by settlers who traveled across the boundless sea from the motherland, and created, well, Ceylondia, which is a city, possibly a state, possibly a nation, possibly a country, never really elaborated on. But anyways, these settlers came from this motherland, whose name is never mentioned if it's not that, and created their city. And in this new world, they found a forest full of things that would like nothing more than to kill them, a group of indigenous people known as the Ura, fair-skinned, underground, tunnel-dwelling people, and the Windbags, these sort of fantastical ghost-like creatures that seemingly are happy to be used as cheap labor in exchange for nothing more than some coal and metal to eat. Eventually, they make a trade with the Ura for a plot of land for uh, seemingly on the cheap due to the fact that the Ura are very superstitious and religious. And in this place, they find these black obelisks that are said to contain millions of microscopic windbags inside of them. And due to this fact, when they get old enough, they remember things. What this mean is never what this means is never really elaborated on, but one of these side effects is that they hold incredible amounts of power, enough to power a city for months if not years on end. Thus, they use these large cores to power their cities and infrastructure and use smaller shards in order to expand into the wild unknown. So doing as newcomers and pioneers do, they expand and expand and eventually create a railway in order to help them expand even faster. Unfortunately, this railway goes into Ura territory and they never got the write-off, so there was war. It's never really stated who wins this war, but considering the fact that we do know that a Ceylondian missionary who was living in the Tazel Terminals, the home of the Ura, basically, you know, just chilling out, and the fact that in Ceylondia, they, all Uras who live there, were never allowed to leave in case they started selling, you know, city secrets, it's probably you know, fair enough to say that the Ceylondians won, thus cementing this story as the highest of fantasy, seeing as the dark-skinned people were the ones who came on top on this conflict. But none of that really matters, because as far as we know, the world just exploded and killed everyone except for a couple of characters that we know about. So yeah, the story takes place after what is referred to as the Calamity. We take control of a character only referred to as the Kid as he wakes up on a rock in the sky. And thus led by the absolutely, completely, and utterly chocolate smooth voice of Rux, this old man, and given emotional support by a couple of other char characters we find later, we set out to find the cores, which can help power the Bastion, this sort of last safest place. This place people were told that if anything happens, you go here. So yeah, we have to get these cores, put them into the Bastion's monument, and that'll make the Bastion expand. It'll give you new options for customization to buy certain items, so on and so forth. And gameplay-wise, this game is good. It's fine. It's not great. It's not phenomenal, but it is perfectly serviceable. You acquire 10, you know, weapons over the course of this game, each of which, you know, has a different function, it behaves differently. If you enjoy top-down games in any capacity, then the gameplay systems here are perfectly serviceable. They are enjoyable, you are bound to find 
you know, a couple of weapons which you really, really like and feel really, really good to use. Furthermore, there's actually quite a bit of customization. Every weapon can be upgraded a number of times, and every upgrade gives you an option of two different, you know, modifiers. You can have the option of, say, 15% critical hit chance, or you can have the option of doing, like, 50% more damage or something like that. Sometimes there'll be something like this, you know, weapon reloads faster, or you can have a bigger magazine, or maybe you will do damage over time, or you can cause an enemy to be stunned for a couple of seconds after being struck. There are all of these upgrades, and each and every one feels substantial. Every single weapon feels like it can be turned into something that you like. There is every place you will eventually find a weapon that pertains to your playstyle. And in addition to that, you can up unlock this place called the Distillery, which is like these alcoholic beverages, and every level you get uh, an extra slot, and these beverages give you a sort of, you know, permanent passive buff. Like, there's this one that says you will do 15% more critical hits if you are at full health. Or, no, no, that's not what it says. It's 100% critical hits if you're at full health. And then there's another that's like, if you're under 33 health, it's 15% critical hits. No, wait, that's... I think those two are flipped around. I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm talking about. But anyways, this is... There's quite a bit of deep customization. So while the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay might be a bit on the repetitive side, you can turn it into something that is very, very enjoyable and very, very tailor-made to your playstyle. So if the gameplay is on the good, maybe great section, what makes this one of my favorite games of all time? Well, presentation. Supergiant games are just fucking phenomenal and making games that just ooze personality and are just this incredibly creative thing. First of all, there's the art style. It boasts a almost 100 hand-painted, you know, artwork world, and I am not surprised at all. This Every level of this game looks phenomenal. It has this cartoony art style that just, it's, it's just, oh, it is candy for the eyes. And despite the art style being more on this, you know, cartoony side, there are legitimate levels which you just go, holy shit, or, you know, just like because of how just jaw-droppingly depressing they are. Like, there is this one uh, level in particular where things are so utterly bleak, they are so utterly despairing that I was like, I was genuinely emotionally moved. Just the, the look of this game is fucking fantastic. But that is not why this game is phenomenal. The artwork is phenomenal, but it pales in comparison to sound. The way this game sounds, I'm not talking about just ambient noise and like how your weapons fire. I mean, they fire well, but they are not show-stopping. What is show-stopping is, first of all, the narrator. Throughout the entirety of the game, your actions are being narrated by Rux, this old man, one of the first people you find in the game. And his voice is on Morgan Freeman levels of auditory sex. He is just honeyed dark chocolate being poured into your ears. It's just, oh, oh, yes. Yes. F fucking phenomenal. And adding into this is the fact that his narration changes based on what you do. As you explore levels or such, he will comment on things you do. He will say, like, there's this one level where you're on a ferry barge, and if you do it you know, perfectly without ever falling off, he'll comment on that. But if you do fall off or get near falling off, he'll go like, hey, do you know how many times the kid fell off there? Good couple number of times. It's just stuff like that. There's like, he makes commentary like, if you pass through a little section, you know, with your full health, he'll go, kid got out without the slightest scratch. Or if you get like, grievously injured, he'll be like, 
kids, you know, he'll like remind you those hope. He is like the kids tonics are there if he needs to be healed and like just stuff like that. Like just listen to his voice. His voice is phenomenal. Grady Senior, Grady Junior. They didn't make it. But him, he survived. Kid finds proof enough that man ain't from around here. Just think, without that man, we wouldn't be here right now, would we? Alrighty, so, Rux is just great, but just as phenomenal is the soundtrack. The soundtrack is this guy by this guy known as Darren Cobb, and I know that because I had to... I had to track down if he had done other stuff in other video games beforehand because his work is just... This guy's music is fucking great. Like, he somehow mixes, like, metal and orchestra and, like, folk banjo shit into, like, these tracks that are just fucking great. Like, just listen to it. Listen to this music. Isn't that fucking phenomenal? Isn't that just the greatest shit? Like, oh boy, like, if you can, purchase the PC version of this game. This game is also on PS4, and if I'm not mistaken, it is on, or at least there were talks of putting this on the PS Vita, but I don't know if you can buy the soundtracks on there. Like, purchase this on Steam, or like, you know, buy the game on the PS4, and then go on to Steam and purchase the soundtrack edition. Just get this soundtrack because this soundtrack is phenomenal this is like this is up there with like the persona soundtracks a series known for its fucking phenomenal music it's up there on my list of favorite video game music like just this game is an auditory treat okay so how about the story of the game itself not the you know background well it honestly it's pretty good at if you just play the game straight if you ignore all extras then you're gonna get this very basic story with a very you know you can pro a couple of hmm. there are a couple of moral choices that aren't so much as hinted at as they release trailers in advance that they're gonna happen and if you just play the game through then when these things happen, you know, they don't have a lot of emotional impact. But if you look for the story, because this has... The game has these sort of pseudo-levels that you can find on the main hub, which are these items that are important to certain characters in the game, and if you play through these, they act as a sort of challenge horde mode when you can get not only some extra money, but also learn the background of a couple of the characters. So if you play these, then you get, you know, this story takes on this all the more complex and bitter tone. There's a lot of, like, irony and such that comes to the fore that you wouldn't get if you just play the game through just, you know, ignoring all of the extra stuff. So this is a game where, unlike most games when they give you, like, this sort of challenge section, it's not just there to get more money or to... Be a sort of like hey look at me if you want an extra challenge do this no if you go through these you get you know some extra bonus story you know content and you get some background to some of the things that happen and it just expands the story on so many different levels okay so I'm about to talk story spoilers I'm about to spoil the whole thing so if you want to go into this game knowing nothing, which is what I say is the best part, like the less you know, like Supergiant Games have this phenomenal skill at crafting these bizarre fantastical worlds that feel like they can exist. And it is just phenomenal to experience these things without knowing anything. So if you, you know, want to do that, skip over to the number on the screen right now. Alright, story spoilers are starting now. As I stated earlier, you begin as the kid. And the kid is this character who 
you know, has this rather tragic past. He never knew his father. His mother was almost eternally sick. And the kid, you know, he had to work from a very young age in order to try to support his family. Eventually, things get, you know, bad enough that he decides to take a spin on the rippling walls. It's this sort of border of the land of Ceylondia, and it's heavily implied that this is a very, very difficult, if not dangerous, task due to the fact that in the whole history of Ceylondia, there is not a single person who has ever asked for a second shift on the walls. But after his stint on there, he comes back home and he finds nothing. His mother is long dead. All of the money he sent back is completely and utterly disappeared. He has nothing in the city. So what does he do? He goes back and signs up for another shift on the rippling walls. Four years pass, and then one day, he sees the world, the, you know, ground basically opens up, fire goes everywhere, and he presumably blacks out and wakes up at the beginning of the game on a rock in the sky. He walks forward, finds his trusty hammer, his shield, and a repeater, which is basically a gun that's, you know, is basically an SMG, and eventually gets to the bay, the bastion. But to his surprise, he finds nobody except for a single old man who tells him that despite no one else, no one else being here, there is still hope. They simply have to find the cores of the city. So he goes out on a quest looking for these cores and eventually comes across two other individuals. Zolf, a missionary from the Aura people whose entire world has been destroyed by the calamity and not just in the physical sense, in the emotional sense as well. As we learn of Zolf, he was this street rat in street rat in the Tazel terminals. His parents had been taken at a young age from illness, sort of a mirror to the kids' own experiences, and he had taken to stealing and thieving to survive. And his, you know, target of choice eventually became this Ceylondian missionary. Well, he eventually gets caught, but this missionary decides to take him in and adopt him in all but name. And eventually he teaches him about religion, about how he thinks that there is the chance for a lasting peace instead of this implied ceasefire between the Ura and the Ceylondians. And eventually, when he dies, Zolf takes up his mantle. He begins to preach to the Uras, and they themselves begin to adopt his beliefs. And eventually, he sees that he has done lots of good here, but it's not only the Ura he needs to convince. So he decides, you know, to pack up, make this pilgrimage that is described as very difficult, and eventually ends up in Ceylondia, where he decides he's going to show them that the Ura are different now, that they want peace, and that peace can coexist. And you know what? The, he, he, these Ceylondians are incredibly receptive to him. They, you know, they you know, agree with his words, he becomes this rather popular figure, and eventually this one girl who is fascinated by him, he falls in love with, and, you know, in Ceylondian custom, he proposes to her, and she accepts, and there's this big old, like, engagement party. But then the calamity happens, and he wakes up, you know, surrounded by destruction and these ashes of statue that were once his friends and he frantically looks for his wife to be and he finds her asleep and he thinks okay maybe not everything is terrible but you know he goes to touch her and she turns to ash and it's like holy shit like this is his entire world has been ripped apart in, ha in fact it's heavily implied that the only reason why he hadn't committed suicide is because we had found him moments before he had done so. So we rescue Zolf, and we bring him to the Bastion, and we continue on in our adventure to 
find more cores, and eventually we come across Zia. Zia is another aura. <laughs> Except unlike Zolf, she is not in Ceylondia by choice. She was born in the city, and it is Ceylondian law that any and all auras born there have to stay there, in case, you know, just to make sure they don't sell out city secrets. And eventually her father, who was an incredibly intelligent individual, is recruited by the Mansers, these sort of secretive scientists, this almost like a black ops division to the army and she is she doesn't have a very happy life in Ceylondia because of the fact that the other kids constantly you know they constantly push her away there's talks about how when she was a child there was a rumor started that her father was a traitor to the city and was selling you know government secrets and she is just lives an incredibly lonely existence where she eventually picks up the hobby of singing and playing on the harp and she becomes rather skilled at it. But again, even though she is skilled at it, she really doesn't have no one to share with this. The city mistrusts her and the people don't like her and her father is almost always, you know, away on government business, on government experiments, like, she learns mainly by herself from these books. And eventually she does make one friend, one person, this, you know, guy who seems to have an actually an almost intimate understanding of Ura culture, despite the fact that he himself is a Ceylondian. And eventually he goes, hey, your father's from the terminals, right? Well, I kind of sort of want to meet a man who is actually an Ura, who lived as the Ura do, and, you know, she's like, okay, all right, I'll take you to him. And, you know, she takes him to meet her father, and he greets him in the traditional tongue of the Ura, their actual language, which it turns out, in Ura culture, outsiders are not supposed to speak this tongue, so her father flips the fuck out and basically banishes her and him from their home, and then uh, she's like, okay, you know what, I've had enough of this city, I don't want to be here anymore, let's run away. We'll hide out in this garbage, and when a scumbag, you know, uh, you know, different kind of windbag, this very large one, you know, eats this garbage, and he's taken out of the city to, like, you know, for him to, like, dispose of it outside, I'm guessing, to, like, secrete it out, they'll, you know, run away and elope to the terminals. But unfortunately, not only does he not come when she tells them to meet up for this plan, as it turns out, the fucking dickbag that she thought she was in love with had alerted the police of this escape attempt. And they're like, oh. And so they capture her, and they go up to his father and say, okay, we will release her if you promise to work with us on this super secret, super duper secret project. And he's like, okay, release my daughter to me, and I will work to you with you, but before, you know, he's taken away, he goes to her and say, go into our den, go into the basement, and stay there, and do not come out. Whatever you do, do not come out at all costs until it's over. And he doesn't really ever state what it is, but as we learn, she stays in the house, she hides in it, she hears this, you know, just humongous commotion, and then eventually her door turns to ash, she steps outside, everything is fucked. There is nothing left, except for the journal of her father, written in the Aura tongue, which she cannot read. And it's like, oh, okay. And, you know, we go through, we find this journal, we find this girl, and we bring them back to the Bastion. And they're like, okay, there's like... You know, it's described as being this joyous atmosphere because, oh, look, another survivor. You know, for a second, we thought it was just us three. 
and then you eventually, you know, you settle her down, and then you give them the journal, and then, you know, Rux comments that, like, there was so much knowledge in that journal. Too much knowledge. You know, it changed, like, Zolf learned so much, maybe a bit too much. If I, you know, if I had just been truthful about it, things would have been different. So it's like this foreshadowing. So right when you find the last core, you go to the Bastion and you find that Zolf and Rux had been in this humongous fight. And Zolf had actually almost destroyed the monument in this fit of rage. He's like, he goes that, you know, Zolf had been decoding this journal and eventually he just snapped. <coughs> oh Jesus. He just snapped and he attacked this monument and he banged it up so badly that, you know, you have to, you know, you just putting the core in it, it, it can't take it. It doesn't work. It, the bastion does not go to full completion as you thought it would. So Rux is like, okay, you know what? I guess we're going to have to go into the wild unknowns. Because the Wild Unknown is the area bordering Ceylondia, and it is this forest filled with things that would love nothing more than to destroy everything else. And it seems that the Calamity has made them even meaner and worse than usual. So you look out for these shards which were put to sort of try to expand Ceylondia, but what you find out is that the animals themselves seem to have, you know, been building a bastion of their own. It turns out that, you know, one of the big problems with mining these cores is the fact that they are almost eternally attacked by wildlife because even they can tell that these things hold power and they've been trying to, you know, take it for themselves. It's heavily implied early on that a lot of these places are only still standing because of close proximity to these cores and shards. So the animals themselves are looking for them and you have to go out and, you know, search for them and invade this, you know, these animals' territory and homes. Like, there's this, in the initial, you know, in the initial levels where you first go out into the wilds, there's this sense of adventure, like, you know, it's one versus nature. But towards the end of it, it's like these animals are very desperately trying to protect themselves the same as your own group of individuals and the only difference between you and them is that you have the skill and firepower to push them back. And as you go on, eventually you learn that the Ura themselves, a lot of them have survived and they've done an almost complete 180 from their sort of, oh yeah, peace is possible thing. Because, as we find out from Zolf, the reason why he flipped his shit and broke the monument is because he learned that the Calamity is the fault of Ceylondia. You know, after the war and this sort of implied tense ceasefire, the Mansers, this super secret science division, went, okay, how can we prevent war? And there was a lot of thoughts, and there was a lot of talking, and then there was a lot of ideas put forth. But the answer actually came not from a Ceylondian, but from one of the Ura ref refugees. <coughs> <coughs> it had come from Zia's father, and he had eventually learned how to harness the power of the world to create this sort of super weapon. And with their research, the, the, you know, they use their research to create this weapon, and the Mansur's like, no, no, this is a final solution. This is, if there is no other possible option, if there is no choice of us and them, then, then only then shall we use this terrible thing. But, Z you know, Zia's father was like, I don't fucking trust y'all. So he eventually sabotages it, so that if it ever is used, then it will blow up in the Ceylondians' faces. Fast forward some time, Zia, you know, her escape attempt is discovered, and the Mansters are all like, hey, we have your daughter. It's time to do the thing. And he goes, okay, 
will do the thing, but of course, he sabotaged it, so when they use this super weapon, it blows up in their faces. And it fucks over the entirety of Ceylondia to the point where there are only seemingly four people of the entire city alive. And it fucks, you know, this, it fucks shit up so badly that even the Ura, who are to the far east, are affected. Even they are, you know, suffering from it. They, they are described as their whole society being underground, of hating to go up to the surface. Yet, when you get to the Tazel Terminals, it's like the underground, you know, main city of the Ura, now among the stars. Like, this is how bad the Calamity is. It somehow took what was underground and made it into some of the highest shit possible. So anyways, we find this out, and eventually Zia gets kidnapped after an attack on the Bastion. So we go forth, we rescue Zia, and we learn that the final core is among, you know, the Ura. So we have to go there, and this leads to one of my favorite climactic moments in video games, because as it turns out, the entire time this game is going on, everything is being narrated by Rux. But, you know, as it turns out, this all happens while the kid is going to the Tazzle Terminals. Like, the moment they were narrating everything in the past, as if it already happened, it was because it had already happened. But when the kid decides to go to the Tazzle Terminals for the last shard, Rux and Zia are all tr you know, Rux is telling Zia the story of how they got there, and during the whole time, instead of going, you know, the kid almost fell off here, or the kid finished this fight without a thing, they're having this discussion, where it's like, yeah, you know, the reason why this all happened was the Ceylonians' fault, but at the end of the day, we are trying to fix our problems, and these Ura are just standing in the way of that. You know, it's like, you told them that we could help, but they are not letting us try to fix this problem. And it's this, like, moment where, like, it's like, Rux and, Z you know, Rux has legitimately no idea what we're doing, and he's just giving this sort of monologue info dump that just feels, it doesn't feel info dumpy. It feels so somber and so, you know, just final. Like, he talks about why he is so adamant about gathering these cores and shards, it's because the Bastion has this one function. That because the cores can remember, the Bastion was created in case anything terrible happened, time could be turned back. Time could be put back to before the Calamity. All of this, all of this terrible loss of life and such, can be undone. All they need is the final shard to do so. And eventually, you know, it comes out, and like, he's talking about how, like, the Ura must be, like, you know, they must be horrified and so confused, because it's one of my favorite times ever. He's like, yeah, man, the Ura must be straight up befuddled by what's happening. The kid's coming in there, and he just ain't stopping. And. This is, you know, put on the backdrop of you acquiring the single strongest weapon in the game, damage-wise, and just completely, like, you are going on this, like, epic, like, this level is twice as long as all other levels, and you are just destroying everything that comes across. Like, it starts with you getting the strongest weapon damage-wise, and eventually getting a weapon so damaging that it replaces your entire, you know, your entire equipment, equipment, you know, loadout. It replaces both of your weapons and your weapon skill, and it's like this moment of, oh my god, I am literally genociding a people. This feels kind of, sort of fucking awesome, but at the same time, this feels like... <laughs> Oh god, I gotta, I gotta stop hitting this microphone, by the way. I'm getting really, really excited, I'm moving my hands, and it's becoming a problem. <laughs> but anyways, this 
goes on and eventually, you know, you come across Zolf. And Rux is like, yeah, they must not be very happy leading the kid here. And like, you come across Zolf's, you know, half-dead corpse and it's like, okay, do I want to drop the strongest weapon in the game for what is certainly going to be the Uro's last stand? Or do I want to grab Zolf and try to carry him with me? And it's like, it leads to the strongest moments in the game. Like, if you continue forward without Zolf, you are basically going through this last gauntlet. Just smashing your way through waves upon waves of these aura who can do nothing to stop you because of this like last minute weapon you are given and eventually you know you get back to the bastion and you get you know you put the core in and you go down and then rux tell you know goes to your face and goes here's the monument you can do it you know you can put you can do undo everything put things to how they once were you know, there's a chance we might not remember anything, but hey, at the very least, everything will be as it is. So you go there, you choose that, and there's this incredibly somber moment at the end with this like gorgeous hand-painted scene of like everything being returned to the past and just just this phenomenal haunting, you know, credits music that eventually gives into the credits and shows a bunch of like still lives of the life and times of all of these different characters of Rux, of Zia, of Zolf, and of the kid and it's like this incredibly somber moment because yes you technically did save the world you returned things to before everything was killed but at the same time what is to prevent this calamity from happening again if nobody remembers how can we stop this? Is there no other way? Uh, but of course, there is in fact another way. As we learn in the final level, Rux is like, you know, there is another path. If we detonate the cores, we could initiate evacuation protocol, and the Bastion will become this sort of flying fortress. I mean, it'll, you know, permanently, you know, destroy the ability to go back in time but we can do so if needed and you know when you come back to the game like one of the things i also love about this game is the new game plus mechanic which is like there is this new game plus mechanic where when you go new game plus you keep all of your weapon progression all of your weapon unlocks everything you've unlocked is kept and you can just play the game again to get extra stuff so that if you, like, wanted to get this particular weapon to, you know, the last level, you can do so. But New Game Plus, despite being a rehash for the most part of the story, has enough changes to it that I still, you know, followed the story almost in its entirety and wasn't annoyed by seeing things again because everything gets changed just a little bit. Like, the game starts with the final, you know, final moments of your first playthrough where you turn back time, and there are a whole bunch of little dialogue changes, like Rux goes, something so familiar about that man. Or, like, he talks about how, you know, he's like, he has these moments of deja vu, or he, like, makes this comment, like, I feel like I've told this part again, uh, before. And it's just these moments of, like, he doesn't remember, but at the same time he has a feeling that he does. And, of course, you know, you get the option to choose the evacuation protocol. And so, you detonate the cores, the bastion lifts up from the ground, and you get this final moment where it's, like, it's incredibly somber, because it's like, okay, you didn't save the world, but is there really any... You know, is there really any option of saving the world if this is all going to happen again? If this is just going to continue happening over and over again? And so it lands in this almost bittersweet note because all of these people are dead, sure, but at the same time, you decided to continue forward. You've decided to see what is out there. And Rux even makes a comment of it being like, oh, 
Like, I, I never thought about what I would do, you know, after this calamity. I would just assume that I would, like, cease to exist in my current form and I would return back to what I once was. But, you know what, uh, you, you get this feeling that he's kind of sort of happy this option has been picked because he's grown attached to these people. And it's like, I feel like this game, you know, there's a very obvious order to be played. First you abandon Zolf and then you go back in time to end to what is presumably a happy ending, but in fact becomes more horrifying as you think about it. But on your second playthrough, what you do is you pick up Zolf, which also becomes one of the strongest moments in the game because your character is just carrying Zolf while the aura wail on you. And eventually they just, they kind of, you know, the attacks start slowing down. They stop, they start slowing down and then they stop completely because the aura just staring at you like, holy shit, like, despite everything, despite all the bad that happened, this guy picked up what was once his friend and he's taken him with me and you know what? We'll respect that. We'll let you go through. And they just let him leave. And it's like this incredibly powerful moment. And, you know, I said that's the most incredible powerful moment, but there's another really powerful moment immediately after where you go down into the monument and you go to the core of the bastion and you know, you can ask some questions about, you know, the evacuation protocol and some other things, you know, some other story beats from not only Rux, but from Zia. And since this is in present time, or not like this story that Rux is telling Zia, Zia fucking talks. And it's like this moment of holy shit. Like there is something about this, like you have been playing this entire game hearing the voice of one character, and when this other character just suddenly, you know, talks and has this voice that we have only heard in a song, which kind of sort of, like, there's something about hearing her voice as a song where you go, okay, that's her singing voice, like, we're never gonna hear it again, but then you hear her voice just talking, it's like this really affecting moment that, like, oh my god, like, we have reached the end. This is the end of the game and damn has it been a journey to get here. But yeah, you get to her and she gives her own opinion. She's like, you know, we could turn back time, but there's no guarantee that we can do anything to change it. Or she's like, any time, any moment of my life I wanted to relive happened after the calamity, not before. So in your second playthrough, you presumably may, you know, use the evacuation protocol and you get hit with this like scene of like, all three of the characters just staring out into the sunset as they rise up, along with Zolf, who is, like, injured to the side. And it, like, you know, it's like this moment of, like, Rux going, you know, I never thought, I never knew what I would do, like I said before, but, like, I'm happy to have y'all at my side. And it's just this phenomenal moment, and it's helped even more so by the ending credits song, which is the ending credit song of the like you know back in the time ending but it also has Zia's theme song overlaid on top of it and it turns out that this these two songs are almost like a duet like they lock together in such a way that it just turns them into these fucking phenomenal songs and you get some little still lives but instead of the past it's of like the future and what's to come and it's just Oh, it's so good. It's so phenomenal. This game, The Bastion, is fucking great. A playthrough takes around four to five hours. If you do two playthroughs, then you're looking at, you know, what, nine, eleven hours? It's just, oh, this game, this game is phenomenal. This is the first game by Supergiant Games, and I wholly recommend you get your hands on it. If you have a PS4, or I believe it's on PS Vita, don't quote me on that, buy it there. But if you have a PC that can run it, and really this game can run on pretty much anything, I highly suggest you buy it there. It regularly goes on sale for like $5, $7 to $10 if you buy the soundtrack edition, which as I said again, buy that. It is fucking phenomenal. You can also find it on Spotify, so just take a look at that from there. But just... The Bastion is a fucking, in my opinion, 10 out of 10 game. It is fucking phenomenal. Go get your hands on this thing. Alright, so that's 
been my review thoughts and opinions on the bastion this was originally like a 10 minute script that i eventually just you know started improvising certain parts and eventually just threw the script out entirely and said fuck it we're doing it live so yeah <laughs> Uh, enjoy my almost goddamn near ha hour ramble about this video game that I fucking love. So if you liked the video, like it. If you disliked it, there's a button for that too. Comment, subscribe, ring the bell. Please share this video around if you would be so kind. You can also check out my social media platforms, my website, and my Patreon to help pay the bills, if you would. You know, give me a couple of monies if you think you can in order to help me to create more content of dubious quality, shall we say. Anyways, that's been me, Juan John John, for the day, and I shall see you all next time. Goodbye. Also, by the way, before we go, if you have any recommendations for games I should play or anime I should stream, I mean, I don't mean stream, I mean anime I should stream into my eyeballs so I can then stream out some, you know, words of consciousness into your ears in order to tell you about my opinions of, then do so. That sentence was fucking weird. That's enough for the day. I've kept you, you know, enough time. Goodbye. <laughs>